Let us pray together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the opportunity to dive into your word, to be present here as a community, though it be online, you're still moving and speaking to us and through us. And so we pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would be present to each one of us wherever we are. Come, Holy Spirit. Guide our reading of sacred scripture. Calm in our hearts and our minds any worries or anxieties, distractions that might take us away from this time. And give us a spirit of openness, a spirit of vulnerability, a willingness to be challenged and to hear whatever message you have in store for us. We pray, God, especially for the ways that we need healing, the ways that we need transformation to feel invigorated, to feel like there's fruitfulness and purpose and com completion, wholeness in our life, that the message of this scripture for this upcoming Pentecost Sunday would fill us and give us hope. Bless us each in the ways that we most need it and guide us at the reading of your word. We pray all of these things in your most precious name, Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome. Happy Memorial Day. I'm Sorry we cannot be together in person, but uh, this is a good alternative. And so I hope that you will enjoy praying together uh, the gospel for this upcoming Sunday, John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. We're in John 20, 19 through 23. This is the appearance to the disciples at the end of John, kind of John's account of Pentecost. Now remember, the traditional account we have of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, chapter two comes from Luke. Luke wrote Acts of the Apostles. And so... If you feel like there's differences between this narrative and the other Gospels, you would be right. There are certain details that might put the timeline in your mind out of sequence. Now, does that mean these things didn't historically happen? No, it means that some of the Gospel writers are writing, or potentially all of them, are writing to convey a certain symbolic significance to these events, so they move them in time or talk about them in a certain way. It was very common uh, for writing about significant events or people at that time to do such a thing. However, some of them write more chronologically, and so they don't conflict. We just interpret some things uh, in multiple layers, some as literal, some as symbolic, uh, and so we don't have to kind of really worry about congruing all of those accounts because there's truth in all of them. But this uh, evening, afternoon, morning, whenever you're watching this, we are in uh, John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. And the main thing to listen for here is how God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. You'll hear a lot of language used in this passage that points back to many things that John said would happen, or that Jesus said would happen in the Gospel of John, and even before that, things that God said would happen, even from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. And so, uh, this is a really beautiful encapsulation of how faithful God is. The setting here is that Jesus, uh, this takes place on the evening of the first day of the week, the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, and so, this is right after the resurrection, right after the events of Holy Week. The disciples are hiding, they're afraid, they don't know what's going to happen, what's going to come of them, where Jesus is. Some say he's been risen, some believe, some don't, and we have this encounter. So, we're going to read twice through. First time through, clear your mind of every other previous image you have of this story, and try and paint this afresh in your mind, on a blank canvas as if you've never heard it before. Pay attention to what you notice. Engage your senses in the text. Act as though you're there. What do you see? What do you smell in the air? What do you hear? Um, all of those different senses. John 20, beginning in verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So now you have this scene hopefully in your mind. We're going to read this a second time through now, and if you're just joining us for the first time, what we typically do is we try and listen on e and hang on every single word and phrase as it's read. Uh, you can keep that image of the scene in your mind, but you want to try and focus and see if there's a particular word or phrase or detail 
that strikes you or stands out to you for any reason. Something unique to you, something that maybe sparks a train of thought in your mind, reminds you of something going on in your life that you've been praying for, a memory, something that's unique to you. It doesn't have to have anything to do with the passage, but to use that as an opportunity for the Lord to speak to you through these words. And so pay attention to what those things are, begin to reflect on them and ask, God, what are you trying to say to me through this? What are you trying to compel me to do? Why is this striking me as significant versus anything else? And also pay attention to any questions that you might have. And you're always welcome to leave those in the comments below as well as, as any of your reflections in the comments or if you're watching this live, to leave those in the live chat so you can interact with one another. So second time through, John 20, verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So I invite you, if you're watching this on your own, or just maybe with one other person, to just take some time uh, for the next moment or so of silence to share your reflections with each other, or especially to leave them in the comments in the live chat so you can interact with one another. If you're in a larger group watching this together, I would encourage you just to take some time to quietly reflect and maybe share your reflections at the end of this video, because if you pause and you're watching it live, you might miss something. But if you're watching this later, you can pause and play as much as you would like. So do that however you would like, but just take a moment to kind of reflect on and really solidify what are those things that stood out or what questions rose to the surface as we read this passage. Beautiful. So I invite you to please continue sharing in the live chat and in the comments at any point. Uh, if you have a question, please make sure you put that in the comments so we can make sure we answer that unless it gets answered here in the video. Um, but you're welcome to share it in both just so people in the live chat can see it. Uh, so as I said, this is a story or a, a scene in which we see many ways in which Jesus fulfills his promises, where he keeps his promises. And I want to go back to the beginning of John. Uh, in chapter 3, verse 8, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, the Pharisee, in the middle of the night, and Nicodemus is asking him these questions, Jesus tells him, The wind blows where it wills, and you can hear the sound it makes, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And so this idea that there will be people who are born of the Spirit, that that will be a promise that will later be fulfilled, begins to be laid down. And then when we get to Jesus' discourse at the Last Supper in the Gospel of John, from John 13 to John 17, he basically lays out to the apostles everything he wants them to know. And then in John 17, at the end of that, he basically enters into a monologue with God the Father, really just talking about his mission and everything he intended to do. And in there, he says a lot of things that are going to happen or that he promises will happen. And so, for instance, in John 14, verse 27, he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. So there's this declaration of peace. Peace that will not 
allow fear to remain. Um, in 16, John 16, verses 20 through 21, he says, Amen, amen, I say to you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will become joy. And goes on to compare that suffering to labor pains and how that grief turns into joy. And then lastly, in John 17, verse 18, when he is in his kind of monologue with God the Father, he says this, As you sent me into the world, so I sent them into the world. And I consecrate myself for them so that they may also be consecrated in truth. This idea that he is intending to have a sort of baptism by the Spirit, an experience of the Spirit for those who are close to Him, who follow Him, that there will be peace that is given from that, that that peace will overwhelm fear, that there will be grief, but that grief will turn into joy. And, as it said in that last passage I read, that they will be sent forth. So Jesus, He lays the groundwork for everything that's going to be happening here, everything that He is about to say and do, He's already promised or foretold before this. And that's a sign of a very good teacher, but it's also a sign of someone who is faithful, who keeps their promises, who knows what he's doing. And I want to pause here, even before we get into the text, and just kind of recognize that, you know, God has a plan for your life. He's a plan for my life. He knows what he's doing. That he had you and I in mind from the very beginnings of the universe. When the Big Bang happened, our name was on God's lips. And the fact that we are even still living, being sustained by the breath in our lungs, and we'll get into breath in a little bit, but that's just a sign that God is still willing us into existence. He still has a plan and purpose for our life. And that it's far better, far more complex and intricate, but beautiful as well as anything that you or I could construct for ourselves. And so these moments of scripture where we see someone prophesying something and it being fulfilled, Jesus promised something and it being fulfilled or brought to completion, that's a reminder of God's faithfulness. And so maybe you need today a reminder that God is faithful. Maybe you feel very sullen or in doubt that things are going to change or that you're going to find what you're looking for or that God is with you or hearing your prayers. And I just want to remind you, my brother and my sister, that God hears. He is with you. He knows what he's doing. You can have faith and trust in him. Just as my children sometimes long for me to give them things that they're not ready for yet or that I intend to give them, but maybe later when it's a more proper time, they may be in excruciating anguish in that moment. But... They know, based on previous experience, that dad is going to provide, that dad is going to give them what they need when they need it. And all the extra stuff that they want, the things that they don't foresee might be negative, I refrain from giving them those. The things that are good, I might give them immediately, or I might hold off for something kind of special, or so they don't get too reliant on always getting what they're asking for. There's always a purpose that's loving, and that is concern for the wholeness of the children when a parent does that. And the same thing is true with God being our Father and we being His children. So I want to remind you of that, my brothers and sisters, that God is faithful. And we see that played out here, and that faithfulness comes to fruition in how the Holy Spirit is at work in the early church and today in our lives. On the evening of that first day of the week, now, as I said, this is the first day of Easter. You know, it's Easter Sunday, the day Jesus rose from the dead. Now, some scholars think that John here is using this symbolically, this phrase, that first day of the week. Because previously in the Gospels, there's reference to Jesus saying, on that day, referencing the day he will come into his glory. And there's this kind of that day, this day in the future. And so instead of John saying this, meaning that, oh, it's on that first day of the week, like that specific day, he uses that phrase to remind the people who heard Jesus say that, that that day Jesus was talking about sometime in the future, that day is today. This is the day that Jesus is coming into his glory. Um, the idea that we have 40 days with the resurrected Jesus, that he ascends into heaven, 10 days later the Holy Spirit comes, and he's not necessarily present for that, that comes from the timeline in Luke. But that doesn't necessarily mean some of those things aren't symbolic. The Feast of Pentecost was a pre-existing feast that had a lot of symbolism about first fruits and offering fruitfulness to the Lord. 40 is a huge symbolic number in the Old Testament, and so either or both gospel writers could be writing things symbolically to convey with deeper truth who Jesus was and why he was giving the Spirit and the power that that brought to the early church. Uh, they could both be writing accurately from memory because they just experienced a severe trauma 
And I don't know about you, but when you look back on those very crazy moments in life, they can be remembered with a little bit of haze. And especially for someone like Luke, who's collecting eyewitness testimonies from other people, John, who was very young when all of this happened and then wrote the latest uh, of the Gospels, there's a lot that happens in between. That doesn't mean that Scripture is with error. We believe that the Holy Spirit guided the writing of Scripture so that there's no error in it, but it was written by humans, and there's different human um, quirks in Scripture, you could say. So that's something also to keep in mind. But nonetheless, it is an evening. They are uh, somewhere where the doors were locked, where the disciples were. Now pay attention to that. The doors are locked, and it says that it's out of fear of the Jews. Now obviously, they're afraid because the Jews, and who they're referencing is not all the Jewish people, they're specifically referencing the Pharisees and the elders, the Sanhedrin, the body of uh, the Jewish hierarchy that condemned Jesus to death. Uh, And so they're afraid that that same thing is going to happen to them, naturally. They're also afraid because they don't know what to do. The person that they've loved, sought after, traveled with, they believed was the Messiah, is now gone. And yes, he's been reported to be uh, resurrected and alive, but only a couple have witnessed that or have heard of that, and doesn't mean they necessarily believed. They're also afraid because we have this historical account in the Gospel of Peter, which is not in our Bible because it was written later, but it's a detail that might be true, we're not entirely sure, but uh, the Jews were accused of setting a fire in the temple or trying to burn the temple. It was a false accusation against them in order to help the people kind of round up the followers of Jesus so that they could kind of quash this, uh, what they saw as a rebellion within Judaism and get everything back to normal. Uh, So whether that rumor... Um, you know, was really a historical fact. They have a lot of reasons to be afraid. But imagine that scene of the door being locked. You know, the door being locked, very much like the tomb. You know, this kind of sense of finality, the sense of waiting, the sense of uh, hopelessness. We don't know what to do. And then suddenly Jesus appears there, not bound by the fact that there is a stone in front of the tomb or that this door is locked, but can still by his power, by being divine, by being the second person of the Trinity, God himself incarnate, the Son, has the power to come into those places that are locked, that are closed off. Same thing is true for you and I. In our hearts, there are certain places or certain things in our life or our past that we don't tell anyone about, that we don't want to be vulnerable about, that we don't speak of, or places of our life that we're not ready to invite Jesus into yet for transformation and for healing. Areas of our life, maybe we're not ready to live faithfully in the gospel. Maybe we live with different personalities, with different groups of people. We have our church self and our work self and our friend self and our family self and whatever it might be. And God forbid those groups ever meet and clash and realize that, you know, we're fraudulent in some way. But what's beautiful here is that even in the midst of that closed off posture, being locked away, Jesus can come to us, wants to come to us in that place and speak peace. So that's what he does. Jesus came and stood in their midst. There are three gifts that Jesus gives to the disciples during this time. And the first gift is his presence. That's simply the gift of Jesus being with us in our difficult moments, in the lowest or darkest of places, that that is a gift, a reminder to us that when we feel alone, when we feel like we're going through immense pain or suffering, We have a God who walked the way of the cross for us, who is walking next to us, who is helping us carry our cross and our burden. And in the midst of that fear comes to us and speaks peace. So first is his presence. The second is his peace. And the third gift that he gives is the power of his Holy Spirit. Those are the three things that Jesus gives to the disciples and the three things he desires to give to us. And so let's see how that happens. And said to them, peace be with you. This word for peace in Greek is irene, and it is a sense of, um, it's not, we think often of peace as uh, the absence of conflict, that okay, nothing, there's nothing wrong going on. But peace in this sense is a synonym to the Jewish word shalom, which means a sense of wholeness, a sense of completeness or fulfillment in God. Last week we talked about joy. Joy and peace are both fruits of the Holy Spirit. They're this kind of constant permeating sense that I can be at joy and at peace no matter what comes my way because I choose to not allow whatever external conflict or stress to permeate that place where I have reliance on God. And that manifests in a joyful relationship with Him, that I have this concrete foundational trust and reliance on Him no matter what. So joy and peace are kind of two gifts of the or fruits of the Holy Spirit that cannot exist without the other. You always find them together. You always find them paired. 
Otherwise, there's some shallow version of either. Either it's just happiness or it's just like contentment or like lack of stress. But there's not that real deep-seated virtue or fruit of joy or peace in our life. Um, and so, peace be with you. Imagine how comforting that would have been to the disciples to hear. Because they see Jesus appear, the door's locked, they're hiding, they're afraid. A, do they recognize as Jesus at first? He has a different form in his resurrected uh, self. Do they think it's a ghost? Do they think someone has broken in? And if they do recognize that it's Jesus, do they think that now his vengeance is going to come upon them? Because they all turned away. They all abandoned him except for John. Uh, they were all gone, scattered, denying him, betraying him, all these different things. And you see all throughout the Old Testament, especially in the kings, the time of the kings, First and Second Kings, First and Second Samuel, you'll see these people have all these different political moves and betrayals. And nothing really comes of it initially. But later on, suddenly, a king will remember, that person was not good to me, and now is my time to kind of strike them, and they will be killed. Uh, and so, you know, there's these, these people who were not very nice to King David, some of his commanders, Joab, um, uh, Shammai, someone who threw rocks at him. And when Solomon, his son, becomes king, David gives him th this advice, like, be careful who you surround yourself with and remember how these people treated me. And one of the first things that Solomon does is has those people killed so that their actions can be known uh, by their consequences, so that they don't have the opportunity to do these things again. So this was, uh, Scripture doesn't always explicitly tell you, like, this is what happens when people make bad decisions. It shows you by the events of their lives and this, how the story takes place over a series of chapters or books. So that kind of theme of everybody has, there's consequences to our actions. The wages of sin is death, as Romans says. There's always going to be a comeuppance. There's always going to be a judgment if we turn away from the Lord or if we betray others. That must have been on the mind of the disciples when they saw Jesus initially. And that's why he first speaks, not vengeance, not I told you so, not anger, but peace. And he says peace twice. And the first time, I think, is to calm them of everything that has happened before. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Now, I think part of that is he's showing them the evidence that he has for which he could not bring peace. Like, look at everything that happened to me. But still, even in the midst of this woundedness that I bore for you and that you abandoned me to, I bring peace. There's a beautiful kind of a um, forgiveness there, an unspoken forgiveness. But there's also a proof there that this is Jesus, that all his wounds necessarily are not there. You know, he doesn't have all these cuts and swelling and bleeding, but he has his, his five main wounds, you know, his two hands, his two feet, and his side. And he shows them as proof. But he also shows them as kind of a recognition that there is power in woundedness. You know, recognize when he was in his resurrected form, the wounds did not disappear. He may have kept them, yes, to show people that he really was crucified. He really is Jesus. He's not some person that looks like him that's pretending to be resurrected. But also to remind us, like, life isn't perfect. We can't be perfect. And the more we try and be perfect and hide our wounds, the more we're going to let them fester and go untreated. And a lot of times, in order to heal from wounds, whatever they may be, childhood memories, trauma, feelings of abandonment, fear, shame, guilt, hopelessness, despair, whatever they might be, some core memory or default kind of mentality that we have that is a wound in us, it's not until we learn to process that and be able to vulnerably speak about it and share it with others, show our wounds to others, that real healing, transformation, and resurrection can happen. You cannot have Easter Sunday without Good Friday. We cannot recognize the purpose of our suffering until we're in that resurrection moment. And we cannot just think resurrection moments are possible and neglect all of the moments of suffering and difficulty that led them there. They are, they are intimately linked. And so in the Catholic Church, that's why we, I wouldn't say celebrate, but we remember at every Mass. It is a representation of the one sacrifice of Jesus on the cross that we are calling ourselves back to Calvary. That's why we have crucifixes in our church, to recognize that our suffering is welcome there, that God suffered for us, and that when we are in our darkest moments, He knows what that's like. He shows us His wounds to welcome us to show us His, and say, God, I don't know what to do with this. I'm weak. I don't know what to do. I have nothing left. But you are God, and I trust in you.
So he's beginning that kind of showing that symbolism to the disciples here. Uh, and also a, a note about his side. Uh, well, we'll get to that when we get to the breath, um, his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Remember that promise from John 16, that you, you, soon you will be grieving, but your grief will turn into joy. That is fulfilled here. When they saw the Lord. Verse 21, Jesus said to them again, he says to them again, peace be with you. Now, why the second time? The first time, it's about everything that has happened. Now they have rejoicing in the present moment. So this piece is about everything that is going to happen because what does he say next? He says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And I've been sent here, yes, to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, yes, to bring healing, to drive out demons, to do these things, but also to suffer for the sake of others, to die for sins, to be persecuted for the sake of the good news, and to reconcile people back to God. And in some sense, the, the apostles are going to do a version of that. All of them, all the apostles who are faithful, were all persecuted or martyred in horrific ways. John was the only one who survived his persecution. He was boiled in oil, and he survived and lived to old age in exile on the island of Patmos. But in exile on some island, not necessarily the greatest life. They all experienced deep persecution, serious threats for their lives that led to all but John's death. And so he's preparing them speaking peace to them because he knows when he tells them that he's about to send them in the same way that he was sent, that fear can come back in. And that is why at that moment, he breathes on them the power of the Holy Spirit. Because brothers and sisters, we do not have the capability of doing what God is calling us to and to endure the Christian walk and all of the trials and joys that come with it, but especially the trials without the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't even say, as scripture says, we can't even say that Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. So here, they're now receiving the Holy Spirit so they can finally understand, first of all, everything that has happened, but secondly, that they can be empowered to do everything that they've been called to do without fear taking over. What has fear stopped you from doing in your life? Is fear stopping you from answering the call that God has for you? Maybe he's placed a certain call or a vocation on your heart. And you're like, ah, I don't know if that's for me. Or I don't really know if God is really calling me to that. That seems scary. Or that seems really out of my comfort zone. Hear this, that he's speaking peace to you. And he's breathing upon you the Holy Spirit through the sacraments, through the, by virtue of the fact that you've been created in the image and likeness of God, that you've been baptized, that you've been confirmed. The Holy Spirit of God dwells within you, equipping you to answer that call and faithfully respond, yes, Lord. Let it be done to me according to your will, just as Mary did. So he commissions them, tells them he is going to send them. And that word for send is apostylin. It's where we actually get the word apostle, one who is sent. Verse 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them. This phrase breathed on them is a Greek phrase that in the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint is the same phrase used in Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, at the very beginning, it's a second creation story, and it says in verse 7, then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust of the ground uh, and blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living, living being. A man became a living being. And then later on in the same passage, there's no uh, particular partner for Adam. And so he calls upon him a deep sleep in verse 21 of chapter 2 of Genesis. Cast a deep sleep on the man, and while he was asleep, he took out one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh out of his side. So there's a significance here that Jesus is wounded in his side, and yet out of that woundedness, he can bring transformation. In the same way that at the very beginning, he used breath and something out of a wounded side to create life, man and woman, the ability to create life. He is reconciling all that went wrong in the Garden of Eden and redeeming it here by bringing new life, new life into new people because he is the new Adam, the new Adam. And out of his side came the birth of the church, the bride of Christ. That's why we call the church she. And so there's a beautiful symbolism here. Uh, the breath of God as well, uh, we hear in Ezekiel. This is a beautiful prophecy from Ezekiel. This is 600 years before Jesus. In Ezekiel chapter 37, starting in verse 9. Um, 
Then he said to me, meaning then God said to me, Ezekiel, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, say to the breath, thus says the Lord, from the four winds come, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may come to life. There's this whole uh, field of dry bones that he is speaking, uh, is speaking over. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath entered them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. He said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They are saying, Our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, and we are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Look, I am going to open your graves. I will make you come up out of your graves, my people, and bring you back to the land of Israel. You shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and make you come up out of them, my people. I will put my spirit in you that they may come to life, and I will settle you in your land. So in the, every prophecy in the Old Testament has kind of an immediate significance and a future significance. The immediate significance here is that God is calling Ezekiel one like a son of man and saying, hey, you as my son, as my prophet, I want you to speak this into existence. But it's also a prophecy about the future that God's literal son, Jesus, is going to do this. He's going to open up our graves, bring resurrection, breathe new life into us so that we are a new creation. And he will do that from the giving of his spirit. That This idea of breath speaks to also the name of God in Exodus chapter 3. And in Exodus chapter 3, Moses is at the burning bush. God is calling him to go back to Egypt. And Moses says, uh, if they ask me, what is this God's name? What do I tell them? God says to them, uh, says to him, tell them my name is I am who am. God replied to Moses, I am who am. That is where we get the phrase Yahweh, the title for God, meaning Lord. It was a, it was a sacred name, a forbidden name to speak, but it was a very difficult name to speak because the actual translation of that phrase, I am who am, is et ye asher et ye in, in, uh, in Hebrew. And when you take those abbreviate those uh, words or those consonants and you make the word Yahweh, you have Y-H-W-H or Y-H-V-H in the Latin translation, but Y-H-W-H. Um, and th those are all breathing sounds in Hebrew. Yod, he, vav, he. They all have these breathing syllables. And so to actually say the name of God, would be like trying to say like, like it, it just would not come out. It's not a real speakable word. And so it became kind of into a word that was more consonanced um, and able to be pronounced, but it was forbidden to speak it. Only the high priest could say it once a year. It was so sacred of a name. But think about that, like the beauty of the fact that every time you breathe, in some sense, we are saying the name of God. And so the moment you are alive, you are breathing, when you come into this world, when you are born, the only way that you have, are given life outside of the womb is because you are saying the name of God. And the day you go back home to heaven is the day you are unable to further speak the name of God into existence, the name of the one who is constantly speaking you and I into existence. And so there's beauty in this breath. The word here for spirit is pneuma in Greek, which means breath. It's where we get the word pneumatic or pneumatic tubes. You know, those like, you know, tubes that go in old office buildings. Um, and in, in Hebrew, it's ruah, also meaning breath, for the word for spirit. In Latin, spiritu, same thing, breath. Um, just that, that idea, that, that life presence of God that we cannot live without the ability to breathe, just as we cannot live without God. We cannot do anything without God. And God is always the initiator. He always gives his Holy Spirit in some facet before we even realize it. We receive the Holy Spirit in significant and special ways when we are baptized and when we are confirmed. But it doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is still not working and dwelling in and around us. But now we, have, we are imbued with a particular mark, an indelible mark on our soul, a particular relationship and command of the Holy Spirit as disciples of Jesus Christ when we are baptized and when we are especially when we are confirmed. And so we have here a sense of a commissioning, a lot of people think that because of this breathing, that this was an early ordination rite, where Jesus is actually ordaining the uh, apostles here as the first priests. And this comes from a very early tradition where there was a, a Coptic patriarch in Alexandria. Uh, a Coptic uh, Christian is uh, someone of the Eastern rite of, of Catholicism. There's the Coptic rite of Catholicism. Uh, and in the beginning of the church, there were five patriarchies, five seats, and the, the highest of which was in Rome, and that was the seat of Peter. But there were also seats of kind of regional heads, 
you can think of them maybe as archbishops, um, you know, currently. And there was one in Constantinople, one in Jerusalem, one in Antioch, and one in Alexandria. And the one in Alexandria, they were all in charge of different areas. The one of, in Alexandria was in charge of Africa. And so the, there's a story that the Coptic patriarch of Alexandria, when it came time to name a new head uh, of the Ethiopian church, the head of the church was called the Abuna, that he would breathe into a, a, a skin bag, kind of like a, a, um, a vessel for water or for transporting different things, and it would be sealed. And they would transport that all the way from Alexandria in Egypt, all the way down to Ethiopia, and they would release it over the head of the person who was going to be the head of the church, and that would be sufficient authority and kind of an ordination for them to begin their ministry. So this is very true. So if you uh, know people in Semitic cultures, there's some people who stand very close, and that's because it's considered a blessing to be able to feel the other person's breath on you. So this is still very, uh, permeates a lot of the cultures of this area still to this day, but there was such significance in this passage that Jesus is doing something very specific here. He's not just giving a gift, that he is doing this with purpose to recreate and restore what was made wrong in the Garden of Eden, to commission the apostles to go and continue to build the church, to share the good news, and to do that by the power of the Holy Spirit as those who have been given a divine authority and a divine identity by virtue of being ordained as the first priests. He says to them, receive the Holy Spirit, again spirit meaning breath, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. This is a passage that we get um, the doctrine of the teaching of confession from. Uh, there's others where, um, you know, he gives this ability first to St. Peter in Matthew 16, I think verse 19. Uh, he talks about the ability for the church to uh, forgive or kind of uh, mediate different disagreements in Matthew 18, 18. Uh, and then here we have this authority given to all of the apostles. Now in Mark chapter 2, verse 7, when Jesus uh, heals the uh, paralytic, he actually says, child, your sins are forgiven. And the people saying, they're the scribes, they're asking themselves, why does this man speak this way? He's blaspheming. Who but God alone can forgive sins? That was the belief. Only God can forgive sins. Now, rabbis could bind and renounce. That was kind of legal language, but it was a determination for them to go to the law and tell the people, where does the law apply? You are bound to this law or you are free of this law because of the circumstances. They didn't have any power. If someone was bound by a law and they had really broken it, they couldn't then say, actually, you're good. I forgive you. They couldn't do that. But they had the power just to interpret the law for the people who had potentially violated it. What Jesus is doing and the power he's giving is entirely different. He's saying, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them. And whose sins you retain are retained. He uses bind and renounce that same language with Peter because Peter's going to be the leader, the head. He's going to be the one who has to establish this new doctrine and teaching, you know, of Jesus. Are people following it or are they not? And how do we determine that just as rabbis would? But now he's also on top of that, giving all of them the power to forgive, to forgive sins. That's the beauty of confession. That we go in, our sins are completely removed. We're not told, oh, you did something wrong and now you just have to go forth in judgment and be condemned. No, going to confession, reconciliation is always a welcoming home. A recognition of the fact that God is forgiving us and making us whole. He's restoring and transforming us back to the people we were created to be. Just as he's writing what went wrong in the Garden of Eden at the beginning of time, the beginning of creation here. Every time we go to confession, he's writing what went wrong throughout the course of our life and returning us to the people he created us to be from the very beginning. And so if it's been a while since you've been to confession, I want to encourage you to go. A hundred percent of people who go into confession and who authentically confess their sins and repent, they're truly sorry of them, they come out forgiven. This idea of a sin being retained, it's not that a priest in the confessional has any desire, ability, or willingness to say, oh no, that sin's not forgiven. That ability to retain is a determination to be able to tell someone, if you are living in evil, and even if you're seeking forgiveness, but you're intending to go back and do this anyway, then you're not making a valid confession. Like your sin is staying with you. They don't say that I'm not going to forgive that. They say that I cannot forgive that because you're not repenting of it. You are not truly asking for forgiveness. And so they allow that sin to stay with that person. But if we come to confession, just that act of repentance, that presence there saying, God, I'm sorry for the things that I've done. We always come out forgiven. Always come out forgiven. And so, no, the, the priest does not remember your sins. No, he doesn't judge you. No, he doesn't tell people about them. He's bound by the seal of confession. 
If he breaks that seal, he would lose his ability as a priest. He'd be excommunicated from the church. And so if I went to a priest and I confessed to them that I had murdered their parents, they could not even call the police and hang up. That's how serious the church takes your sins and the desire for you to be forgiven. That's how serious God wants you to come home and know his mercy and recognize that nothing that you have done, will do, are doing, will ever do again is ever enough to separate you from the love of God. One of the saints once said that all of the sins that have ever been committed are but a drop of water in the ocean of God's mercy. And so all of these things that God is giving us, the the gift of his presence, the gift of his peace, the gift of the power of the Holy Spirit. If there's anything standing in the way of those gifts, for the Holy Spirit to really working in, to be at work in your life, maybe it's just stubbornness or a lack of openness or a lack of discernment, unwillingness to answer the call of God, or serious sins or habits, vices that are leading us away from him. I encourage you to pray about those, to bring them to the Lord in prayer, and if there are sins, to bring them to God in confession so that we can be free of them. You deserve to be free. You do not need to be locked away in your fear because Jesus has risen from the dead. This is the day of his glory that he promised. And we look back on all of the Old Testament and we see God keeps his promises. He is always faithful. And so he's always seeking to be faithful to you and to me to bring our greatest good and to restore us back to the people he's created uh, us to be. And so anything that we may feel fearful about in that is something coming from us. Because God will always enter those places and speak peace. I pray that this was a blessing to you. If you have further questions or comments, you just want to share how this stood out to you, whether you liked this reflection or this video or not, uh, we love to hear those things. I love to hear those things. Your feedback is always very important. But especially if you have questions that were unanswered, please leave them in the comments so that we can answer those. Uh, So let us end in prayer together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of this word. Thank you for the gift of your spirit, the gift of your peace, the gift of your presence. Help us not to stand in the way of us being able to receive those gifts each and every day. We pray, God, that you would reveal to us the obstacles that are standing in the way, if there are any. Reveal to us the ways in which we are weak and we need you. Reveal to us the ways in which we are afraid and we have locked doors away of memories or experiences, different areas of our life that we have not yet been willing to bring to you. And help us to have a complete, open, and whole desire to be in relationship with you in every part of our life. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill our entire being, our entire body, our entire soul, our whole life with your presence. And guide us. Guide us to say yes to the callings, the different things that the Lord is asking of us. Guide us to know and experience the gifts of the Holy Spirit so we can bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit love, joy, peace, and all of those good things out in the world. And we pray, God, for the ways that we are still looking for healing, that we still feel in the midst of darkness or worry, that we're still in the midst of our woundedness, that we'd be reminded that you come to us in those dark places, those places that are locked away. You come to us with your wounds, showing us that they can be redeemed and reminding us that you have the power to do it. Help us to let you do that in our lives each and every day. Bless us this week as we reflect on this reading, and bless us again as we hear it proclaim this Pentecost Sunday, the birthday of the church, the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Let it reinvigorate us, transform, and inspire us as we hear it again this Sunday. We pray all of these things in your most precious name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.